In 2010, Strathfield Council celebrates 125 years since it was proclaimed on the 2nd of June, 1885. The district became one of Sydney's most affluent suburbs, just a stone's throw from the city, known for its large homes and estates. Strathfield fast became a place of transport innovation, reaching to Sydney and beyond, and an education centre for excellence, with well-known public and private schools within its boundaries, and much admired for its tree-lined streets and parks. The area has also become an important commercial centre, providing goods, services and employment opportunities to local and regional communities. Today, we can reflect on our past where it all began and you'll hear recollections from past residents sharing their experiences on life in early Strathfield. Together, let's celebrate this milestone by taking a look back to where it all started in the formation of our community, Strathfield. Aboriginal Reflections Prior to European settlement, the Strathfield municipality was inhabited by the Wongal clan of the Darug tribe. The landscape of early Strathfield included large forests of eucalypt trees with many native grasses, abundant with wildlife, making it an ideal place for hunting and food gathering. Land clearing and urban development from the late 1800s is likely to have contributed to the end of Aboriginal occupation of this district free settlers and local farmers. The need for food in the early colony prompted Governor Philip to develop farming land in Sydney. Philip wrote, if 50 farmers were sent out with their families, they would do more in one year in rendering this colony independent of the mother country as to provisions than a thousand convicts. In 1793, the first free settlers commenced farming at Homebush but due to their inexperience, poor soil and lack of capital, the farms failed. Significant residential development did not commence in the district until the late 1860s. Strathfield, the naming of a new municipality. Strathfield Say was built at Redmire in 1868 by Walter Rennie, a painter, decorator and one-time Lord Mayor of Sydney. It's possible Rennie named his house after a ship that had made many voyages to Australia between 1831 and 1868, bringing new migrants to Australia. It seems fitting that the future municipality was named after a ship that crossed the seas, bringing new adventurers to Australia's shores. Today, Strathfield has become a vibrant, multicultural hub, welcoming residents from all over the world. New beginnings, new council. After many petitions for and against the formation of a new municipality on Tuesday the 2nd of June 1885, Strathfield Council was officially gazetted. The name Strathfield was chosen to describe the new district, which included the suburbs of Homebush, Redmire and part of Druitt Town. The area was approximately two square miles and had a population of approximately 600 residents. Early descriptions of the newly formed Strathfield were often published in newspapers. One example describes Strathfield as, this pretty suburb is about seven and a half miles from Sydney to the westward and stands some 60 feet above sea level. It is one of the nicest of the suburbs, looking so fresh and healthy. There is any amount of green foliage which gives it its pretty appearance. Memories of life in early Strathfield by the late Elizabeth Ward. Every street had lovely big homes. A good many had a third story, which was a square tower, oh, very fashionable at the time. Every house had acres of garden and orchard and most kept five servants. Most kept two or more horses. Almost everyone had a four-wheel carriage or sulky. There was plenty of domestic help in those days. My mother paid her help six shillings per week and treated her like one of the family. The first elected council for Strathfield. The first council meeting was held on the 31st of August 1885 at Steephurst, Alban Road, Strathfield. The council comprised of six aldermen who were prominent merchants and businessmen, including the first mayor, George Hardy, who was an auctioneer and mining agent. These well-connected aldermen set about building a first-class residential district to promote a strong and healthy community. This continues today with council continuing to provide infrastructure such as roads, lighting, footpaths, community services, libraries and parks. 
John Robert Firth, alderman and former mayor, expressed his views on the success of the council and community in 1945. It cannot be denied that the people of Strathfield have made an excellent job of their municipality over the past 60 years and should be applauded for their good work, which has helped to build actual services and amenities whilst maintaining a financially robust council. Furthermore, in presenting the views of the Strathfield Municipal Council and I think of the vast majority of the residents of Strathfield, I would say first that I believe the municipality has been successfully governed since its incorporation and that it can be regarded as a model municipality. The building of the Strathfield Council Chambers. The new council required a permanent place for meetings and offices. In 1886, they purchased land to build a new council chambers on Homebush Road in Strathfield. Newly arrived from England, architect John Sulman was awarded the tender to design the council chambers. Upon its official opening on the 31st of October 1877, the Sydney Morning Herald noted, the new building is centrally situated and is built upon plans and in scale in keeping with the rapid progress of the borough, being of dimensions which would necessitate no additions or alterations for many years to come. On the right track, Strathfield Trains. The Strathfield district was among the first places in Sydney to have rail transport. In 1855, Homebush Station was built followed by Strathfield in 1876 and finally Flemington in 1882. The development of train lines was significant in establishing Strathfield as a desirable residential community, enabling city-based workers to easily commute between their workplace and their home in semi-rural Strathfield. Strathfield is also accessible to the greater Sydney region via major roads that over time have transported people, horses, trams, motor cars and buses. Early schools in Strathfield. Strathfield, even in the early days, became well known for the many public and private schools within its area. Many of the first schools in Strathfield were home-based and the first public school in the area was Druitt Town Public in 1881. Schools were built to educate local children in the area and many families settled in Strathfield, attracted by the high standard of educational facilities. Strathfield today has become an important regional centre for education, from preparatory to tertiary levels. Community life in Strathfield. The residents of Strathfield have long enjoyed social and recreational activities. Wealthy Strathfield residents joined together in 1881 to form the Union Recreation Club of Redmire. The members included prominent Strathfield residents living in the area and at the time the club was an important meeting place for politicians, merchants and public servants. The club organised many events including lawn bowls and social tennis matches in the community. Memories of Early Strathfield Society by Jean Farncombe, the late granddaughter of retailer David Jones. When I reflect on the social life of the time, to the once well-known Sunday evening suppers at Glen Luna, the home of George Sly from 1889 to 1925, the word soiree for those evenings almost brings us back to the novels of Charles Dickens. It carries us back vividly to the difference in home entertainment before the flood of electronic material, either with or without regret. It brings to life our picture of a wedding group, puffed sleeves and enormous hats included, on the lawn of Holyrood, or along the aisles of the Strathfield Recreation Club. Strathfield Society was a conservative society. There were parties and magnificent gardens in which to hold them. It was as though the century, which chronologically ended in 1900, survived almost unchanged until the cataclysm of 1914, even in many aspects to when the heavy hand of economic change fell in 1930. Memories of early shops in the district by late local resident Vic Keary. I came to live in the Strathfield locality in October 1914. The area had a real village atmosphere and it was a time where people visited their local general store on a regular basis to not only pick up the necessities, but also shared a yarn with others about what was happening in the district. 
For years, we dealt in mainly fruit and vegetables, but later this changed into mostly a milk bar and confectionery business. We used to have three men going around in carts serving big runs in Strathfield, Homebush and Flemington, and even as far as Lidcombe. The carters carried baskets of fruit and vegetables, very attractively arranged, to show to the customers to get orders. Prominent early residents. The district was also home to many influential politicians, including former Prime Ministers Sir George Reid, Billy Hughes and Frank Ford, and former New South Wales Premier James McGurr. Strathfield was home to many famous people who were pioneers in Australian commerce and business, including biscuit manufacturer William Arnott, the David Jones retail family, Frederick Peters of Peters Ice Cream, and William Cotty of Cotty's Jams. The development of industries in Homebush and Enfield of state and national importance provided many local residents with employment. Businesses included the Homebush Sale Yards, Enfield Marshalling Yards, EMI Records, the Ford Factory, Sydney Markets, and NB Love Milling, which today operates as George Western Foods in Strathfield South. Arnott's Biscuit Story in Strathfield. One of Strathfield's most prominent families were biscuit manufacturers, the Arnott's. For many generations, the Arnott family lived in Strathfield and were active in community life. Arnott's established their biscuit factory in Homebush in 1908 and were one of the district's largest employers. There seem to be a lot of biscuits in this large Australian factory. But the output is only keeping up with your appetite, for the annual average consumption of biscuits per head of population in Australia is nearly 14 and a half pounds. Well, if I'm going to eat my annual 14 and a half pounds, I'll make a start on those. Many residents still recall the smell of freshly baked biscuits and the Sayo sign, which lit the night sky of Homebush. Arnott's biscuits, such as Tim Tams and Sayo's, have become household names and Australian cultural icons. Generations of Australian families still enjoy their products today. James Matthew Tui. James Matthew Tui, the famous brewer, purchased Torrington on the boulevard in early 1886. The house had been built by George Hardy of Hardy and Gorman Real Estate Agents, the first mayor of Strathfield. They became very successful hoteliers who owned over 800 hotels in the 1880s. However, it's quite ironic he lived in Strathfield, a suburb where hotels were not allowed. Strathfield Today. The Strathfield Council area today remains predominantly a residential area with some industrial and commercial land use. The council area encompasses a total land area of approximately 14 square kilometres and has a population of approximately 36,000. We're proud of our heritage, and as we look around our community, we can see many reminders of days gone by in our historical buildings, streetscapes, schools, churches, village precincts, parks and open spaces.